Welcome to Hockey Podcast. My name is Amit Dehuja, and today's special guest is frontman Kyle Rutschland, also known as Bactra from Havoc Faction. How's it going? Hey guys, how you doing? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. How are you doing, man? How's things been going with you with your band and all that stuff? Dude, it's been it's been good. Um, we've been we've had a really good year so far. Um, we played some of our biggest shows. Um, like the last show we played was a sold out show at Chain Reaction with uh, Scary Kids Scaring Kids for their anniversary tour, and uh, that was super fun. We're stoked about that. Did you? Um, sorry, yeah. did you? Didn't you also um open for um Priest and Julian Kay at the Roxy? Uh, yeah, at the uh the whiskey. I mean, sorry, Whiskey Go Go. That's what I meant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you're all good. Yeah, I know those those venues are right next to each other. Um. But yeah, and that was that was our other big show. That was back in uh, April, and that one was super fun. That was pretty much sold out, and um, yeah, we had a nice big crowd. We actually filmed that one, um, put that up on our YouTube, the whole set. So that was really fun to do. Yeah, I was able to watch it. You guys did a good job. Fortunately, I couldn't go to the show. I wanted to go see them, and then I saw you were on the their um, list at the bottom. I was like, damn it, I should have gone. Oh, man. Yeah, that was a super fun show. Priest. Priest and Julian K were great. Um, I also even got to meet uh, one of my like musical like inspirations, uh, someone I've been a fan of for a long time, um, the Annex. Uh, he was there because uh, he's also from LA and he also like collabs with uh, Julian K sometimes. So I know he's friends with uh, the guitarist. I'm spacing his name right now, but I got to meet him as well. Um, but meeting Brandon. Uh, the annex at that show was like made it just like kind of really extra special. Mm -hmm. So no, I know you're a new guest to my show. So I like to ask my guest this question to actually start the show, which is where are you from? Tell us your origin story. Oh yeah, for sure. So um, I was born in Oregon in 1990. I grew up in Oregon, Southern Oregon and Medford um, till I was about 10. And then my family moved to Maui and in, that was in 2001. And I lived in Maui until I was 18. I like graduated high school in 2009. And right after high school, I moved here to Los Angeles. And I've been here ever since. And I just made 15 years, which is kind of wild to think about. <laughs> it's been mm -hmm. quite a day. Mm -hmm. So what was your upbringing like for you, man? Uh, I was honestly really, really blessed with uh, a really good family. I had two amazing parents and they gave me a, a younger brother um, named Corey and him and I have been close our entire lives. Also we're in a band together um, at one point, but yeah, it, uh, it, it was good. Um, like I, we had, of course, like, you know, every, everyone has some sort of hardship in their life. Um, I had to kind of go through the event of, my mom battling cancer when I was young and um, <clears throat> kind of just going through a whole angsty time. It was right after our move to Maui, she was diagnosed with cancer and then she had to battle that for a few years. Ultimately cancer won, unfortunately, but it was, uh, you know, it was definitely something that shaped me to go through that as a, from 11 years old to 13 years old. Um, but then my dad uh, eventually remarried and my stepmom's pretty great. And we've always just been a tight knit family. So I, you know, even through all the hardship, it's like, I can't, I can't complain because I'm lucky. My dad was there all the time. That's he uh, cool. always was there for my brother and I. So, yeah. So now how has your, your favorite childhood memory influenced your music which eventually, as you got older, you decided, I want to start to be in a band or start my music career. Oh, that's a really good question. I really like that question. Um, I would honestly say, like, music has always just been so important to me. Like, ever since I was little, I remember, um, like, when I was, like, I, it's kind of wild. My long-term memory is really good. Like, I remember um, the day my brother was born in 1994 I was like three and a half and I still remember that day I remember walking up to the hospital with one of my mom's friends and like was there for that whole event so like my long-term memory is pretty great I remember like 
always wanting MTV on when I was really little and my mom would put it on and like it was always music videos and just music and I was just exposed to all this different stuff and I would just dance to it and just I, I was obsessed there's like video of it on like VHS's um of me just like wanting to dance to every, MTV all the time and then as I got older um I became obsessed with like you know the boy band stuff I was really into the Backstreet Boys and NSYNC 98 degrees all that stuff and then that blossomed into blink 182 and creed and lifehouse and like a bunch of just kind of alternative rock music 90s alternative like third eye blind goo dolls like i've always just been obsessed with music um and i'd love to just like sing and dance and my mom was always just like i could see you doing something with music like she always kind of said that she's like to me and my brother, because I would get my brother in on it too. Once he got old enough, we would just be singing and dancing and putting on little performances at home and stuff. And um, so it kind of like, it's just, it was always just there and instilled in me. And then as I got older and like, I got into the music that like really shaped me, which was like, you know, a lot of emo and post-hardcore and punk and metal and all that kind of stuff that music just meant so much to me because it gave me an extra layer of depth that it just, you know, all those lyrics that were super like meaningful and heartfelt got me through like hard times, you know, just everything that everyone's kind of goes through during those formative years. Um, it kind of just transcended into that. And then I became like, I got to a point where I was like, yeah, that's all I want to do. I just want to, I just want to make music. <laughs> <laughs> and then I from there I was like okay now I have to learn I have to learn how to make music but it was yeah so it's it definitely has just always been in, like instilled in me it's just a big part of my life since I was really little so how long did it take you to learn music and then eventually start with your band with your brother which was called Greenlight Theory um dude it was it was a journey I remember like when I first started like trying to teach myself guitar like we had an acoustic guitar in the house um, cause my dad was going to try to teach himself guitar and he never did, <laughs> but at least he got a guitar because then my brother and I, uh, started teaching ourselves. Um, he got better than me faster. Uh, so I switched to learning bass and I kind of, I went to a 311 concert and 311's bass is fucking rips. And I was like, dude, I'll play bass. So I just went and bought a bass literally the day after that concert and started learning bass i had a friend named andrew who's a killer musician he could like literally do anything um having a friend like that definitely helps because <laughs> he's able to like he's able to just teach me and he made it look so easy and i'm like okay cool i can do this um but it was just kind of a journey and just te like teaching myself everything and having friends help me and learn like that and then um that was like when i was in high school and then when i graduated and i moved to la um that's when I really had to take it upon myself to be like okay if I want to do this I really have to like I really need to buckle down and like try to get better and learn more and everything <clears throat> so I actually had a two I was in like two female fronted bands before green light theory um and we played one played one show and then like that was it but it was fun I, I learned a lot from that and then the other one uh, we played, I think, like a couple of shows and um, we actually made like a little bit of money off of like one or two of the shows. And I was like, oh, shit, I'm like actually getting a taste of what it's like to be a performing musician. Um, but then that ended as well. And then it was after that I was like, OK, I'm like hungry for this. Like, I feel like this is attainable now. And so when Corey finally moved to L.A. with me in 2012, I was like, he was, he got really good at guitar and singing and stuff. So I was like, dude, let's just, let's just start a band. Like, let's write it. Let's at least just like write a song together and like go from there. And he was like, at first he was like, he wanted to be a musician too. Like he played, I remember he played like an acoustic show back on Maui and Hot Topic with a friend of his. He had like a little project, um, a little MySpace project called Pretty Going Fast um, when he was in high school. So and he, you know, he wrote some cool songs that I was like, dude, like, this is actually pretty good. Like, I was really impressed with my little brother. I was like, I was like, dude, let's fucking let's write a song together. So we wrote um, what would be Who's Lost and Found Now. 
And I brought that to uh, one of my good friends at the time. Well, he's still my good friend, but at the time he was pretty new friend. We just became friends. Uh, my friend Scott Waldman. And I know that like he was in a band called Little Beach and he used to be in another band called City Drive and which was signed to like Columbia and they did like touring. I think they did a year of Warped Tour or something like that. I can't remember. Um, but he had experience in that. So I brought the song to him. I was like, hey, what do you think of this song? And he was like, oh shit, this is really good. He's like, you guys need another guitarist? And I was like, yeah, we do. And he's like, all right, let's do it. So then that's how we got Scott. Um, because of that song he's like i believe in the song i was like if you guys can do more like this like this could be this could be something really cool um he's like if you guys just listen to me and like just kind of follow my lead like i think we could do something with this so then after that i hit up my friend drew um he was a fellow barista who says we're gonna starbucks at the time um he was also a barista and i knew he played drums so i hit him up and i was like hey dude here's some like kind of demos of some songs you're writing if you want to be part of this. And he liked it too. And he's like, all right, yeah, let's fucking do it. So that's how Green Light Theory formed, basically. That's cool. So what were some of your adorable experiences during that time? Did you do any concerts or anything like that? Oh, yeah. Um, that was when I really experienced what it's like to be a musician and to play like legit shows and sell merch and hustle and have a fan base and everything like that like we kind of did it, like for three years we kind of accomplished a lot it was really impressive and a lot of that was definitely scott's experience in the music industry and everything like that because obviously Corey and i had no fucking idea so he was really able to kind of take some of the reins and like handle some of that business aspect that gave us a lot of opportunities like we got to open up for hawthorne heights in new york city um we got to play with against the current in new york city um we our very first show as green light theory was actually at the roxy that's nice that's cool and that was like i think we brought like over 100 people to that show and um it was wild like it was like when those curtains first came up like i was so nervous i was like holy shit but i was also so excited like it was like i was nervous but also was like this is exactly like what I've dreamed of like this is this is like everything I've ever wanted so it just also felt like this is where I'm supposed to be as nervous as I was but it's just like I was just kind of more excited I was more like yes like it was like fuck yeah this is this is it and uh ever since then I've just I just can't I just can't stop but yeah all the experiences I had in Greenlight Theory definitely shaped me and I learned a lot so going back to your very first uh concert you uh you did were you when you were performing, were you paying attention to the audience or were you just trying to like, let me get through my set so I could don't mess up? Honestly, I would probably say at that point after because I'd had a couple little shows under my belt. I definitely was just I loved being on stage okay. and as uh, as nervous as I was, I I definitely remember and I think I have pictures of it that kind of showcase it. I was definitely just. I was in performance mode and <clears throat> I think that honestly is where I shined because like my bass playing mediocre at best, <laughs> but I loved just performing. Like I loved having energy and I loved singing and I loved like playing music, even though I was like kind of sloppy here and there, it was still more so just, I had fun playing and performing and being like in front of a crowd. Mm -hmm. So do you have any like rituals or anything you do before you start performing like a warm up session with your voice, anything like that? Oh yeah. Especially, um, especially now. Um, I have to, because screaming can take a toll, especially if you're not warmed up or, you know, if, if you're just, if you go in raw dog in your voice, uh, it, it can definitely lead to damage. So I make sure I'm really well warmed up. I also have a thing I enjoy, like, whether it's before practice or before a show, if there's a 7-Eleven nearby, I love getting uh, a French vanilla cappuccino, half French vanilla cappuccino and half just coffee. That's always just kind of been like, I don't know why. It just became my thing that's what I drink before I perform because it's like a little bit of caffeine, but not too much. It's warm, sweet, 
it's just kind of like comforting. And there's always a 7-Eleven usually kind of nearby wherever I'm performing at. So I've always been able to have access to that where it's like a Starbucks or something that has like teas, like kind of a little harder to get to sometimes. But I can usually find a 7-Eleven and like get my hands on a little French vanilla cappuccino coffee thing that just... I don't know. It just kind of, it became my new comfort thing after like 10 years. Mm -hmm. So now tell us about your brand new project called Havoc Faction. When did you get started and what is it about? So Havoc Faction, um, I technically came up with this idea kind of, the, I think it was in 2016 before Greenlight Theory officially broke up. Um, at that point, I loved what we were doing, Greenlight Theory, and I really thought that there was going to be longevity to it. So I was kind of like, okay, cool. If we're going to be doing this for a bit, I also want to kind of make like a side project, something that I can kind of just put my heart into. Because I mean, I was putting my heart into Greenlight Theory, but I want to do like something different. I wanted a different kind of style of music. I really love heavy music. Um, so I was kind of like, I want to kind of have my own little side project that I can kind of front and like kind of maintain myself. So I thought Havoc Faction was just going to be this science fiction-y side project thing that like would have like just a little cult following and, you know, I'd be able to use kind of Greenlight Theory fan base on it, but also like kind of garner like new fans too. But I never really like thought it was going to be like my main thing. I thought it was going to be this just fun little side project I just kind of work on in my own time. But then once um, Greenlight Theory ended uh, later in 2016, I was like, well, shit, I guess I'm going to make this like my full thing because I, I asked Corey, I was like, do you want to continue Greenlight Theory or like, what do you want to do? He's like, nah, I don't really want to do music anymore. <laughs> I was like, well, fuck, okay, well, I, I do. So I guess Havoc Faction it is. And um, Havoc Faction always had this like kind of science fiction-y story element to it that I wanted. It's gone through a different, a few different like kind of incarnations but once i settled on like the idea of like being a vigilante in a post-apocalyptic world that's where i was like that's it that's what havoc faction is and then i started coming up with concepts and designs for like how i want to look on stage and like what kind of like like what would a vigilante in a post-apocalyptic world look like and I want to incorporate like kind of that punk influence that I have and stuff like that. So that's kind of where that aesthetic like came from. And so once I kind of got all that locked in, then I started writing a song and I always had this riff, like this, uh, the kind of picking and, and chords that for a song that I never really did anything with, but I had it since like 2012, I think 2011 actually. So when I first wrote it and I was like, well, this isn't a good time to, finally finished this song that I wrote five years ago. So I turned that into a song and that became Keyboard Warriors. And that was the first song that uh, I released. And which is perfect because I think it has a cool eerie like sci-fi vibe to it. And, um, and I was like, all right, cool. This is it. I'm, I'm doing it. I'm doing this. And this is when like I really had to push my vocals because I knew I wanted to write kind of heavier music and I was so used to singing a little higher pitch, like really pop punky kind of stuff. And I knew I wanted to scream and I didn't know how and I had to learn that. So it was just kind of this process that I learned actually like while in the recording studio, which was with um, my friend Joel Ferber, who's the guitarist of the band True North. Um, he found Greenlight Theory and reached out and was like, yo, I, I just finished at mine. I would love to like produce you guys if you have a song. At the, at the time, I was kind of running, uh, like, the socials for Greenlight Theory. And I was like, hey, dude, uh, Greenlight Theory unfortunately broke up, but I'm starting a new project, and um, I could definitely use a producer. So maybe we can uh, work on that. And he was down, so we met up and told him my ideas and went to his uh, home studio and recorded keyboard warriors he actually played the lead guitar parts in that song the guitar solo and stuff i played uh everything else um and then tim their singer actually kind of helped me learn how to scream while in the studio and that was that was a lot of fun to kind of get to that point and hearing those screams back on that song that was like literally my first time screaming 
And I was always like, fuck, dude, these are brutal. Like, I can do this. I think I could actually fucking, I can stream. I just got to, you know, practice it and get it down. But uh, yeah, so that's, that's like really how Havoc Faction started. So do you, do you, uh, did you have a, do you have a comic book, a favorite comic book character or comic books you read when you were a teenager or a kid? Because when I was looking through your YouTube channel and your band, I, I saw a lot of influences from like comic books. Do you grew up reading any? Yeah, so my my first like introductions for sure was like the Batman animated series as a kid. Batman, X-Men, Spider-Man. That like is what really got me into that world. I would say like I got into actually reading comic books um actually in my 20s is when I actually got into reading books. Um and I would say like I started off with Spider-Man got into that and then Nightwing actually became one of my favorites. I enjoyed I enjoyed Night I I feel like I um related to Nightwing more than Batman. Mm -hmm. Batman's cool and stuff, but it was reading the Nightwing comics is where I was like, oh, I like this. This is for sure this resonates with me a lot. Um so having reading a, a lot of Nightwing that's kind of like what inspired my look for backdraft a bit of nightwing and then a bit of red hood like i love i love this the backstories of all the different robins in in batman and i kind of just took took little bits of those characters and that's kind of what inspired um backdraft basically um but yeah <clears throat> the comic book aspect, like I fell in love with just the world building and the character arcs and everything like that, the art styles. Mm -hmm. So now going back to Havoc Faction, um, can you tell us a story about all the characters, the costumes, superpowers or villains in the world that you either thought of or like already is already out there in the world that people can like think about? Oh yeah, absolutely. So like kind of just in a nutshell, um, the world of Havoc Faction is kind of this post-apocalyptic kind of wasteland world that was forged by, um, originally, uh, a disease that kind of overtook the world and it was, it was manufactured. It was a manufactured virus that overtook the world. And in the midst of that chaos, like, um, there was some a little bit of nuclear fallout because they're trying to contain everything it's just the world just kind of really turned to chaos it just turned completely upside down in the midst of all this um the people who put out this virus who manufactured the virus they're the secret society and they went underground while like the world kind of just tore itself apart and then years later like a couple generations later they rise back up to the surface and they form what's called unity city uh, in the midst of this, they uh, only have so much room in their city walls. So they had to kind of push people out, but they also wanted these people to be the quote unquote explorers. Um, so these people are now in these like kind of building these settlements outside the city and they're trying to kind of rebuild like in this wasteland. But then they realize, oh my God, no, this world is still in turmoil. This is not how we planned. This is, we thought like, we could reset this world and like make it beautiful, but it's, they, they learn that like, Oh, we actually fucking destroyed everything. So, but they're like, no matter, it's fine. We'll still, we'll, we got to stick to the plan. So in the midst of that, um, you do have people who are living outside the wasteland and everything. And then the people who were pushed outside to settle outside there, they have kids and now they're all trying to survive and be out there. And then they realize, Oh my God, we got fucked over by, our government and the city, like they just put us out here to die basically. So now there's this kind of class war between um, the people who are at, out in the settlements, out in like outer Haven and the wasteland, and then the people like inside the city. So that's where that turmoil kind of starts and backdraft and the other acclimate, I call them acclimites. Um, these are people who had their genes kind of like also manipulated in order to survive in the wasteland so it's kind of like i call them uh, acclimations because it's like you know you get acclimated to your new and your surroundings your new environment stuff like that so i call them acclimites with acclimations and um 
this is where I take a little inspiration from X-Men. I always thought X-Men was really cool. I love like the ensemble thing. I love the superpowers. I love like they're mutants and they're born that way and all everything. Um, but I also really uh, love the idea. I, I watched this documentary on Netflix about um, gene, gene hacking mm-hmm. and people being able to manipulate genetics and stuff like that. And I was like, damn, that's technology that exists. Like that's crazy. So I kind of really took inspiration from that. And I made it so like these people could actually manipulate their genes and give themselves these abilities. But it's only a technology that only I made it so only one person had it. And they're the ones who kind of did it to all these kids and all these other people. And it kind of just spread like that. So you have these acclimates who live outside trying to survive and they have these new abilities. Um, so that's what kind of what forms Havoc Faction. It's these kids who grew up and they have these abilities and stuff. And so they kind of take it upon themselves to be the protectors of their settlement, Outer Haven, out in the wasteland, because the city's not doing it. So within that realm, Havoc Faction is now the, the protectors of their Outer Haven settlement, but they also want to be the liberators of Unity City because they realize that the governor who's in charge of all of this is actually just corrupt as fuck. And there are people who live within the city walls. So there's just conflict in that city as well. There's conflict. There's people who like absolutely, who have, you know, have a bleeding heart about the people who are pushed out and were screwed over and just living outside in the wasteland. They feel like they need to be helping everyone. And then there's the people who are more like, no, absolutely not. We need to stay with, we need to just stay here. This is our sanctuary. Like everyone else can just fucking suck it basically. Mm-hmm. So, there's that whole inner turmoil as well. So basically I'm just kind of, I take a lot of inspiration from a lot real life, like, you know, politics or scenarios or class wars or just philosophy and things like that. And um, I've been just kind of building, building that world. So besides Backdraft, what other characters are there? Cause I know there's your character, you're the front man, then who are the guitars, bass player and the drums? What are they representing in the have a faction? Yeah, so um, I finally have kind of a stable lineup because I've gone through I've gone through a few different characters. I had to kill one character off my original drummer, uh, Paul, aka Brace. Um, he was kind of the first one to leave the band, and he's also like my closest friend. So I kind of was like, "Dude, I'm gonna is it cool if I kill you in the comics?" He's like, "Oh yeah, it'd be an honor." So I gave him this like kind of kind of death that sets backdraft on this path um of trying to find new new faction members and everything like that so i recruited my new drummer kevin um aka zero uh his ability is he can make people sick by touch that's why we call it like patient zero Mm -hmm. um so he's like he can't get sick or anything like that he's like impervious to uh disease viruses everything but he can make people sick by on contact um and then there's uh joel my backup vocalist rhythm guitarist aka phase um his ability is he has like super hyper uh senses um and uh reflexes so he can kind of move really quickly not necessarily like the flash he's not like a speedster he can like run really fast but he has reflexes that he can like just kind of really move really quickly and he perceives time in a different way. Like he can kind of see things like moving at slow-mo or he kind of see how things are like kind of moving in general. And it gives him this like extra reaction time. And that comes with like all his heightened sentences and stuff like that. Um, And then I have Neon, my lead guitarist. Um, He has the ability to conduct electricity through touch. So like he can power things um, like lights, um, vehicles, things like that, whatever like needs electricity, like he can kind of conduct electricity, but it can also be a thing where you can use like, you can make anything a weapon basically. Like, you know, if there's like enemies that are like on like touching metal or water or anything like that, he can kind of just send that electricity through and, take them out like that that's that's really cool so now from all the songs you have released so far from your past band and now what is your favorite to perform and what do the songs mean to you personally Ooh, that's a good question um 
So since since our since our start, uh, we I mean we honestly in the past like, God, we we released our first EP in twenty eighteen. So since and I really uh see I've had two EPs and like a couple singles. I really have only had like seven songs that we've performed, or I guess eight now with including the newest one. Um I would probably say My Human Condition is one of my favorite songs that I've written for Havoc Faction. Um the music was written by my former member Ty, um, aka Nomad. He wrote all the music for My Human Condition, and I was able to write the vocals over to that. And that was always one of my favorites. It's a ballad. It's so the one that like kind of tells the most story, I think. I really try to paint a picture in that song. It's also the song that anytime we have a fight scene, when when my villain shows up at shows, uh, we usually have a fight scene, and I usually have him win because it goes perfectly into my human condition because that's is a song about picking yourself up after losing picking yourself up when you're defeated um which is something like you know you can take in the literal sense of like losing a fight and picking yourself up which is kind of how i wrote it but it's really a metaphor for just when you feel defeated by life and that's why that song has always meant a lot to me because it's really like you know it's something that everyone i feel like can they just goes through you just there's so much time so many times you're just like I feel so defeated <laughs> how do I get back up so that song was written to kind of be be a song about that um so that's one of my favorites especially when we perform it after the fight scene I feel like it's always has this like extra like layer of depth to it that makes it really powerful um but honestly I would probably say Homewrecked is one of my favorites to perform live because that song is our probably most upbeat song and it's bouncy and it's catchy. Um, it always gets a pretty good response and it's just fun to jump around to. Um, but ending our, our set with like, welcome to the fight is also really fun because that's our heavy kind of more metally metal core kind of song. Um, so that one always like that one usually gets a pit and people go go hard to that one. So that's always that's always fun. And then like the way it ends with the outro um, where I'm just doing uh, harmonies and stuff with uh, Joel and I get to kind of take a little lead part, just kind of sing it almost like in a poppy way when I'm just kind of like singing that outro. It's just kind of different. And it's it's a strong way to end the song and end the set. So that's always that's always a good one too. I would say those are my top three. So now, how do you handle criticism or negative feedback about your music, and what steps do you take to improve your craft? Oh, that's a good one. Um, you know what's funny is, uh, I would probably say the only like negative criticism I would ever. I don't even really consider it consider it negative i've only received really constructive criticism which is that you know sometimes sometimes my vocals are a little um hit and miss which is understandable because i do a lot you know I, I run around i say i jump around i'm singing and i'm screaming so sometimes i i hear there's a little bit of inconsistency there but that's really coming from like people that are like my harshest critics and i so i just take that i'm like okay i'm gonna make sure i work really hard to just be on it and just really put myself to that next level. Um, but I've never like, I would probably say the only negative stuff I've ever received like online or like from like strangers is, uh, you know, they, they love to lean on the, your band's just a gimmick. And to that, I always say, I'm like, it's not a gimmick because it, it has intention. Like I don't it's just hard work. It's not easy to be a band and like grow out and go get popular. It's like a it steps involved. People don't understand that. Like new bands struggle for a few years and then when it hits it, you guys get popular, then it's like, okay, then you have made it wherever your goal is. Yeah, exactly. And so like I, I always kinda hate when people have that mindset of like, oh, you you wear costumes, you're a gimmick. And I'm like, I don't even, I honestly don't even know what the fuck that means. But because for me, I'm like, no, I, I wear this with intention. There's meaning behind it. Mm -hmm. Like, honestly, like 
it's almost more of a gimmick to just kind of go out and not give a shit about what you're wearing and you're just kind of looking plain like to me that's almost because like it's almost like that's your theme your theme is just unintentional clothing where it's like with us it's like everything's intentional like we wear this because it fits with this other story that we're building and like we are these characters like this is this is who we are like there, there's no like we don't do this for attention we do this because that is the theme and that is what we are building and that is that it, it, there's a point to it and and also yeah we do want to be memorable we do want to be a band if like if you see us you have no idea who we are but you're like oh yeah the band with like the masks and the lights and stuff like we have like things that are on us that when we perform people will remember and they can like kind of gravitate to and be like oh i love that i love this aesthetic this is so cool and different i feel like this day and age it's like if you're not striving to be memorable and different, you're, you're going to be just lost in the shuffle. Mm -hmm. I agree with that. 100%. 100 so, so yeah. So like anyone who's like, Oh, you're just a gimmick. I honestly, like I used to get a little affected by it. I'm like, no, I'm not. But now I'm like, I don't care. Dude. It's just, it's fine. That, that obviously means you don't have the mental capacity to grasp what we are doing. And if that's the case, I, you're, you're never going to be a fan of us because you just you don't have that capacity we are meant for people who have that capacity who want uh, a storyline who want depth who want more meaning who want more content and like just more to grab onto in for our bands you know we're not just like a surface level band like and it really shows with all of the people that we um that we kind of garnered as fans like they they do want more and like i get it because I, I honestly almost gave up on the concept at one point in time because I was like, oh, I feel like there's just too much superhero stuff. And I feel like maybe like people are just kind of sick of superhero stuff. And even I was at one point. And then there was, but then there was, there was this whole turning page where once like Marvel and, and DC and Star Wars just kind of started getting a little bit fucking ruined. Mm -hmm. I agree with that. That's when... That's when I personally stopped watching all of them because, like, yeah, I'm done. I mean, they are releasing the Deadpool Wolverine movie that I may may see later on, not when it releases in, like, two weeks. But that's probably the only Marvel-related movie I'll watch, and that's it after that. I'm done, kind of done with them. I've been done with them after Endgame. Like, you guys have taken the brand to, like, a whole completely different level. Yeah. yeah. No, it's – they kind of just – it's it, it just kind of feels soulless. And I, at first I was like, man – you know, maybe I should just stop because I don't want people to put us into that realm. But then I realized it kind of clicked. I'm like, actually, what this does is make more room for new original stuff because just because like uh, Disney might be ruining these things that we love, it doesn't mean we still don't love them. We just want that in a new way. We want that in the way that we love it. So now I'm like, oh, there's just more room for me now to get those fans who feel who feel like they've been like betrayed or to feel like they're just done with all of that shit because now they I can give them something new to latch on to I can give them something new to be like oh this is a whole new thing and new new origins to discover a new world to discover new villains to discover and just I can give them that and they can feel like because that's how I would feel that's how I feel when I when I find new new comics or new characters that I'm like oh yeah this is great like when I just discovered invincible and stuff because of amazon prime i'm like oh my god i'm like so into this invincible world now like i want to go and read like all those comics in which i didn't even really know of invincible before the show and now i'm like obsessed and so like that's kind of what i'm hoping to do with havoc faction i would love to have um i would love to have <clears throat> an animated series and if that's how people discover Havoc Faction, fuck yeah. If I can get that and put that on Amazon Prime or something, oh, that'd be rad. Um, like, I would love for this to be just a full-on multimedia thing, like, beyond the band, where it's comic books and animated series, animated movies, and our live shows, like, video games. I would love to have a video game. So, like, that's kind of the goal of what, we're, what I'm trying to accomplish with this. I, I'm trying to give it that longevity, that... I don't have to rely solely on the music aspect. Like this can be an original IP and it can be something beyond. 
So. Mm -hmm. So now, are you working on any new projects that you'll be releasing soon, like music, comic books, any based on your band? Yeah. So right now we are working on uh, an acoustic EP. Um, we took uh, uh, five of our songs. We recorded acoustic versions. Uh, I recorded uh, a new original song. Um, that's an acoustic song, so that'll be on there too. Um, so that acoustic EP, we're hoping to release that probably maybe in the fall. Mm -hmm. uh, but on top of that, we are writing a full length album. And that is kind of like our big goal right now. We've written, um, I want to say about four songs so far. Uh, we want to do three more and then kind of go from there. We kind of really want to lean into the conceptual side of the, for this record and give it like a couple interludes and like little story elements in, in the album. Um, like kind of how, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with star set, but they're kind of like a big inspiration on why I wanted to be a concept band because their records, you listen to that record front to back. It's just, there's awesome little things in between songs that just kind of like really kind of immerse you into the listening experience. And it's like listening to a story basically. So that's what I want to do with this, um, but in my own way. But that's what we're working on on top of, um, yeah, the comic book. I'm working on a comic book sampler right now that I can start putting out at shows and selling online and stuff like that just to get people or passing out even. I want to be able to pass it out at like Comic Con. Um, I want to be able to have like something tangible that can get people interested before I actually release the, uh, the seven issue comic book. Mm -hmm. So that's what we're working on right now. Mm -hmm. so now what hobbies do, uh, do you enjoy doing when you're not like writing music or just when you want to relax oh so i'm like I, i'm a balance between i love going outdoors i love surfing and hiking and rock climbing even though i haven't rock climbed as much as i used to i do miss that a lot um i love being outdoors i'm actually gonna go surfing today after our uh after our discussion um so that stuff means a lot to me, but equally on the, on the other side of it, I really enjoy watching. I'm a big movie buff. I love watching movies. I love watching good shows. Um, I recently kind of started getting back into playing video games. I haven't like played video games in a long time, but I picked back up Devil May Cry because mm -hmm. I heard that they're going to be doing a Devil May Cry anime on Netflix. So I kind of just been like getting all back into Devil May Cry, which is like probably one of my favorite franchises or like favorite IPs. Like, favorite video games in general i love the devil may cry games and i honestly like i was playing devil may cry 3 the other night and i was like dude if i could have like a havoc faction game that kind of plays like this i would be so happy like that would be so fun um so i've been kind of getting back into that uh just kind of yeah just just chilling and getting inspiration from things that i love movies and stuff like that so what are some of your favorite movies that you enjoy and why? Oh, so I'm a big like sci-fi person. Like some of my favorite movies is like, I love the Blade Runner uh, movies. It used to be just, you know, the one, but ever since they came out that sequel, I'm like, oh, I love both. Love both of those movies. Um, I love Blade Runner. I love The Matrix. <clears throat> I also really love comedies like old school, like Van, uh, like Van Wilder is like one of my favorite comedies. Um, wedding crashers stuff like that but of course like, like i've actually been showing my girlfriend um the x-men movies it's been kind of fun rewatching those kind of fun because there's not like there's fun aspects to it but there's also times like god there's so many missed opportunities in this <laughs> or like you know things that they're like why did they oh my god so i forgot like some of the things that like drove me nuts about some of those movies but it's been so fun to kind of rewatch them because we're getting ready for deadpool because i'm excited for deadpool it, i feel like Ryan Reynolds is going to make sure that it's good. And, mm -hmm. you know, having Hugh Jackman back as Wolverine and the yellow suit, like there's things I'm excited about with it. It's, and it's nice to feel excited about, about it. Cause there's been so many other things. I'm just like, ah, I don't care. I don't care. Like the acolyte show didn't even bother. I Not didn't even. watch any of the star Wars stuff. I stopped watching star Wars after the last movie with Harrison Ford that he was in it. I was like, I'm done with star Wars. That, movie, that last movie was like my end with star Wars. Like I'm done with your franchise. You've taken it also down to to the gutter. Yeah, I yeah same. I just can't. I mean, there Rogue One was cool, and like the two seasons of Mandalorian was good, but like 
it's just hard to even enjoy those when everything else surrounding is just kind of crap. So it's just like, it's been rough. But um, what else have I enjoyed? I'm trying to think. Oh, dude, the last Top Gun movie was probably one of my favorite movies that's come out recently. Uh, I watched a lot of movies, so sometimes I forget like, oh, what else did I just watch that I really loved? I try to have a list of like things that I watch that I love, but um, yeah, I love I love me a good action, love me a good horror. I kind of want to go see that new uh, Long Legs one. Um, it's that new horror movie that uh, uh, Nicholas Cage I think di directed or something like that. Um, I'm gonna try to go see that this weekend. I think I'm gonna try to go see A Quiet Place Day One. I like the Quiet Place movies. Um, so yeah, I have the AMC uh, Stubbs premiere thing, so I can go see like a few movies a week. So it makes it makes it fun. It makes me be like, oh, okay, I might as well just go check that out. Check out something I maybe normally wouldn't have. So, so now, what are some of your favorite TV shows that you enjoy watching? Um, so I've been watching The Boys. This season's a little up and down compared to the last seasons. Um. But I've also just been kind of getting back into anime. Um, I started rewatching Attack on Titan and My Hero Academia because uh, I never finished those. I, I I just fell off them like after a couple seasons, and I'm like, I need to go back and rewatch these. So I've been actually rewatching some anime. Um, I just worked Anime Con just a couple weeks ago, so it kind of like really just kind of invigorated like my love for anime again. And I was like, I need to get back in anime. It's been a minute. So, yeah, just kind of getting back into anime and stuff. Other than that, like, some of my favorite shows that I can rewatch is, like, Altered Carbon. I love the Altered Carbon show on Netflix. I think that show is really cool. I'm really excited for them to do the Bioshock show on Netflix. I think that could be really cool. Um, How I Met Your Mother is, like, one of my favorite shows. I'm usually, I'll usually throw that in my rotation when I just need to throw something on just to, you know, feel good. I'll throw, I've watched how I've watched through how I met your mother probably like four times. So that's one of my favorite shows. Same with friends. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much on top of my head. What I can think of. So how was the anime convention that you went to? Cause that's when I started following you on social media. So after I saw you, well, after I'm on your band page and I saw you had a personal page, like I'm going to start following you there so I can reach out to you to have you on my show. So how was the convention? Oh, I love that. Okay, cool. I was wondering too. I was actually wondering, I was like, Dude, I wonder if I wonder if uh, this guy got my flyer when I was passing these out at anime. No, I started following your band, and I don't know if you run the band's page, but you followed my podcasting account, and then I saw you, and I went on the band's page's Instagram page, and I was like, and I clicked on the tag thing. I was like, okay, the main guy, one who's in the middle wearing the mask. I want to start following him, and then I could reach out to him to bring him on my show. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> I love that. Um, yeah, the anime expo was super. A lot of cool stuff. Uh, my booth I was working at was right next to the Gundam booth. And I was like, dude, I miss Gundam. I forgot how much. Like, I used to love Gundam. I had so many Gundam figures growing up. And I wish I still had them all. My brother had, and I had such a huge fucking collection of Gundams. Um, so that was really cool to see. Uh, what else was really cool? There was so much cool stuff. A lot of cool cosplays. Um that was my first time being inside. Last year, I went to the Anime Expo, but I was just hanging out outside. Uh, I was just hanging outside in my Nightwing cosplay. and was just like kind of hanging out with people and taking pictures and stuff for a little bit, which was super chill. Made some friends, ran into some friends. Um, it was fun. But this year was cool to just kind of like be in it and like experience like the ex exit. Uh, I was in the exhibition hall. So just kind of or the exhibit hall exhibition uh so that was fun it was cool to just see just all the new stuff that is coming out and everything did you ever dress up as uh backdraft at any of these conventions to like promote your band yes absolutely um <clears throat> i try to do that i actually did that at la comic-con last year and i was walking around as backdraft and i actually got like a good amount of people who were like yo what like what are you cosplaying like this looks so cool i love your jacket and your mask and stuff um and so i would I, I had flyers on me so i'd be able to pass them out be like mm -hmm. i'm actually this is what i uh, wear on stage in my band um and other people too they'll get the references because like i always say backdraft is kind of a mix of like nightwing and red hood 
So I'll get people to be like, oh, are you kind of like a Nightwing Red Hood mix? And I'm like, yeah, like it, that's the inspiration behind it. So that's always kind of fun to talk to those people who kind of get the reference. Um, but yeah, so that was kind of a hit last year. So I try to do that every time. I did that a little bit at Anime Expo. I, did, I didn't have the jacket, but I had like my vest and stuff with the shirt and the mask. And I was kind of just walking around, standing in areas and kind of handing out a bunch of flyers because <clears throat> when I'm inside, I learned when I'm inside doing it near the booth, handing out flyers is easy because people are just there to take in information and learn new things and like find out like what's going on. So they'll take flyers and like be interested. Whereas like when I do it, when I'm outside, like in the lobby or outside of the building, like trying to talk to people, they're more like, I don't care what you have to say. <laughs> So I've learned now. I'm like, okay, cool. Got to do it inside, inside the area, the booth area. That's where people are interested. So found that hack. So did you ever um collect Funko Pops when you were like a teenager or in your 20s? You know, it's funny. I've always like, I, I admire Funko Pops, but I don't have any. But I always thought they're like cool gifts and like, I love that they literally make a Funko Pop out of like any character. Like if there's, if there's a character who has like some sort of fan base or just exists in some sort of fandom, like they have a, a Funko Pop figure of it, which I think is fucking cool. Um, would, you want, yeah. would you want your own Funko Pop as a uh, backdraft? Oh my God. Yeah. That'd be awesome. I would love that. I wonder if I can get in touch with them and be like, can you just make me like 10 of these and I'll sell them at my shows. <laughs> that'd be rad. I would love that. Or if that dude, if, if we get big enough to where like, I can go to a store and be like, oh, look at this. This is a fucking Funko Pop of me. That would be, I would be like, I made it. I did it. I can die now. <laughs> so now tell me about the three most influential people in your life and how they affected you positively or negatively. Oh, man, you got these good in-depth questions. Um, I would start off with, Dustin Kensru, the singer of Thrice, is probably one of the most inspirational people to me. Um, Thrice was always my favorite band. Dustin Kensru is just such a he has a he he he's a very strong character. He's very guy, he's kind of like like his moral compass is just so I don't even know what the word is, but it, he's just like gravitational like he I he it, I feel like it's because of him is why not solely but like a large amount is because of why my moral compass is kind of set like strongly like listening to his music and his lyrics just really inspired me to make sure I'm being like a good person basically is what I'm trying to say like and to look outside myself and look inside myself and look at the world and look at just everything through such a lens that allows you to see things for what they are and but also have an open mind and everything like that. So getting to meet him actually like was one of my favorite moments in my life. So Dustin Kensry for sure is one of the most inspirational people to me. Um, I probably have to say, honestly, my dad, I feel like I can't go without saying like my dad went through so much and has also stayed such a strong, consistent person. He never let the hardships of life, like derail him or deter him from being his like true authentic self. And like, there was really, it just feels like there's nothing that can like bring my dad down. And for that, I just have so much respect for him. And I'm grateful. I'm grateful that my dad is is that way. Like losing my mom, he was there for us. That he that like that didn't even derail him from being a good dad. Um, uh, my parents unfortunately lost a, their house to a fire in 2020. And even that didn't derail them. Like they stayed strong and they came out and they found an even better house that they love. So like they just they go through these things that just and they just they come out like still solid and I love that. Um and then I'd probably say the third one 
is going to be a fictional character, and that is going to be Dante from Devil May Cry. I fucking love that character. <laughs> I just love his... Um, I just love how he handles life. I love that he's fighting demons and does it with a sense of humor. Doesn't take life too seriously um, and kicks a lot of ass and just enjoys doing it. And I love, I love, I love that he doesn't take himself too seriously. I think that's great. And I, I, just, I always try to remind myself that I don't need to take myself too seriously. Um, sometimes I get caught up, but I usually try to live life on that on that edge kick a lot of ass but don't take life too seriously mm -hmm. now if you could have dinner with any three people dead or alive who would those people be and why oh man dead or alive well obviously it would be nice to have be nice to have dinner with my mom mm -hmm. um it would also be nice to have dinner with ryan reynolds i feel like that would be a great time i would love to have dinner and drinks with ryan reynolds um, and then I would also, I would also love to have dinner with, uh, Jesse Leach, the singer of Kill Switch Engage, because he enjoys whiskey as much as I do. And I feel like we would just get into such good conversations. I actually was fortunate enough to have a conversation with him recently online over video, uh, over video like this. And, um, Getting to talk with him was so great. I love his energy. I love also, he's actually up there with Dustin Kensrew. Like he's really helped shape me with everything, including my music, like my lyrical standpoint, but just life, how he looks at life and how he attacks life and just how he is as a person. So like getting to have dinner with him would be so fun because I feel like we have a lot of similarities, but also I would be able to like learn from him, but also just have a good time, have a good dinner, enjoy some whiskey and just kind of shoot the shit. So that would be uh, that. I feel like that'd be a good time. Now, if you could travel to any time, any history in time, where would you want to go to and why? Honestly, I would have loved. I, I would probably go back and watch Star Wars when it comes out in uh, what was that, 1976, 77. I would want to go and be able to go back in time, watch star the original star wars movies when they originally came out and just be part of that experience that's what i would like i would love to just witness that and be part of all those people and just that whole phenomenon just when it's first coming out to see empire strikes back the fucking day it comes out because then you're also like in the 70s and 80s where it's just like life was just so chill <laughs> I mean, at least it, that's what it seemed. It seemed like it was just a good fucking time. Um, music was good. Movies were good. Everyone's chilling. No one's just on, you know, cell phones. You had to, like, give out physical numbers to get mm -hmm. in touch. Um, I feel like that would be a fun time to just experience. So now going back to video games, did you ever grow up with a video game system? If so, which one was your favorite and why? Oh yeah, so my very first video game system was a uh, Sega Genesis. And I loved my Sega. I had all the Sonics. Sonic was probably my first favorite video game. I was obsessed with Sonic. Um like I I was a Sega kid. I had friends who, you know, Mario was was their game and like, you know, Nintendo was their system, but like for me it was Sonic and Sega. Um and then that's also when I had like Spider-Man games and X-Men games and uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle games, um, Altered Beast, Streets of Rage. Like I was obsessed with my Sega. I loved all my games. And then after that was the PlayStation, PS1. And oh my God, I'll never forget like playing like Phantom Menace, the Star Wars episode one game on PlayStation with like my friends just staying up till like two in the morning playing star wars getting through that game so fun um twisted metal was a like a favorite i remember falling in love with that <clears throat> soul reaver playstation was like a lot of fond memories tony hawk the very first tony hawk game um yeah all of that definitely shaped my childhood 
So now, if you had the opportunity to live in a video game world, which one would you choose and why? Ooh. Um, probably I only played it a little bit, but I really love the cyberpunk world. I think the cyberpunk 2077 world is really cool. I love that a lot. Um, but also I really love fallout. <laughs> like fallout three and stuff like fallout new vegas mm -hmm. it, it's tough though because i feel like i would i would live like a, a week in that world i'd be like all right i'm over it <laughs> i'm over this fucking wasteland <laughs> but um but it would still be fun i still have like i still have this weird like kind of obsession with post-apocalyptic worlds so i'd probably enjoy it I'd probably make the best of it i just love the lawlessness of it and the survival kind of thing about it and just you're just trying to get by and survive and there's all these creatures and I don't know. I just, I love that. I love that kind of that world, but yeah, 2077 would definitely be a world I'd rather live in because then it's really cool technology that exists and I can still kind of like live a comfortable life, but you're getting this whole kind of like sci-fi aspect to it. That would be kind of interesting, but yeah. And what was the most challenging thing about gaming for you? Oh man, the most challenging thing about gaming, I think the most challenging thing about gaming I've ever experienced is online playing. Like I remember trying to play Call of Duty online and just getting wiped out or trying to play Smash Bros online when you're fighting against someone on, online on Smash Bros, getting wiped. Like anytime you're doing any fighting or first person shooter online, you I'm just like, fuck all you guys, dude. I'm like where's the, where's the computer? I want to play the computer. <laughs> So now questions to end the episode. What is giving you hope right now? Oh, what's giving me hope? Um, honestly, I, I would say probably interactions like this. I like the fact that you reached out, like you found me and you're interested in my life or what I do as an artist and you wanted to have a conversation with me. Um, stuff like that gives me hope. I, I love connecting with people. I love that the internet gives us that access. I love that we can find people that we, if we never cross paths with them physically, but we cross paths with them online, like we can connect still. And that gives me hope because I think human connection is what we're lacking ironically, uh, but is what's absolutely necessary to like have like a, a functional but also like flourishing life so this kind of interaction is what gives me hope <laughs> now if you had the attention in the world for five minutes what would you want to tell them this can be about anything you want oh just kind of just go on a little just go on a little thought rant mm -hmm. uh, i don't share anything um you know, I guess it would be one thing I just would love to just say to, to people is uh, you don't have to make everyone your enemy. I feel like people are so quick to think of someone as their enemy, especially if they're different from them or have like a, they come from a different background or they have a different perspective. Um I feel like people are really quick to kind of just put people into a box and group them together. And if that, if there's just one small part of them that aligns with someone that they don't like, or they think is bad, those people are now bad and they're losing, like, I feel like they're losing this individuality. You're not letting people be individuals anymore. And that's something that, I've been having a really hard time with one experiencing myself, you know, from a be being on that end of it. Um, but also I hate to see other people like when I see it online or something, or I see even, or even just people having a conversation with each other. Um, I'm like, guys, not, it doesn't need to be, not everyone needs to be your enemy. Mm -hmm. Like you don't, to 
it doesn't have to be a me versus you, us versus them, them versus them. Like it doesn't, it's just, it's just a lot of conflict and it's a lot of division. And I don't know, growing up, I never really thought that would be a world I'd be living in because growing up, I never really felt like there was a lot of division, like not, at least not in, you know, my childhood with, same, with the other Same with me. Same with me. I feel like there was not nearly this much division. And even as a young adult, even in like in my really early 20s, it seemed fine. I would say like this whole polarizing kind of thing really came about when with social media becoming politicized. Like when Instagram first came out and Facebook was first out, it was fine. But then once the media started being able to weaponize it and mm -hmm. turn it into a, a propaganda machine and they can start making things that influence people's thoughts and opinions. Um, I would say probably, I mean, this, I feel like it really started happening in 2015 before the election um, with Trump and um, Hillary. I feel like that's when so many things were just being pushed around and creating all this division. And I was like, dude, what is happening and i'm not saying that like that's never happened to a certain degree throughout life media has always kind of had some sort of influence and done like that but now it's just become so personal mm -hmm. yeah, i've noticed the same thing people here's i here's the thing people listen to other people what they're saying and then they follow their actions like people don't know how to critical think anymore mm -hmm. yeah because we have all these influencers mm -hmm. Telling you what to buy and you know, all that stuff and what to what what to how to think or what you should who to vote for and all this stuff. And it's and it's like I don't know, like I understand it's it's nice to of course you like, oh, I respect this person, I like how they think, they kind of think like me, they you know, they live a life similar to mine, so like I can hear them out and and respect what they're doing. But then it's like the moment they'll have a difference of opinion they'll just cancel and be like oh never mind i don't like that person anymore and it's like no that person's still that person they just have a different opinion than you like maybe you should hear them out a little bit or something but then you also get those influencers or people that are bought and sold who yeah they they were living a life a certain way and then all of a sudden they were offered a lot of money to start giving a different opinion mm -hmm. <laughs> And it's like, who's to say when that happens? Or who's to say if they developed that own opinion on themselves or if they were bought and sold to sell this opinion now? Um, so it's just a lot of, you don't really know what to believe anymore. And so, yeah, like you said, more than ever, people really need to be able to take a step back and think for themselves and think critically and not just be influenced. I feel like we're living in this world of just being influenced. and. It's funny because more than ever, like for me with my punk roots, my punk roots were always about like, if everyone else is doing it, I don't want to do it. Mm -hmm. I thought that was what punk was about. Like you do the uh, like opposite of whatever everyone else is doing. Now it's like, it's like, I noticed like, I'm not going to name bands, but I noticed that they're doing that. Like what they say, their fans will also follow them. It's like, thought it was like, do the opposite <clears throat> and not follow the crowd, have a mentality. Yeah. Exactly. And yeah, dude, I'll see a lot of punk bands that are promoting a certain opinion or a certain thought that I'm like, it's not very punk rock of you, dude. <laughs> and that's why like, you know, like before I, I, I used to be kind of, it's tough because I, I, I do, I am kind of like, I do have strong opinions and stuff, but I typically don't like to push them or, or share them in a way that I'm like, you better, like, if you're our fans, you better be doing it this way. Like, I don't ever fucking think that. Like, I don't, I want, I want fans from all walks of life. I want fans who have all kinds of thoughts and stuff. Obviously, like, yeah, I have certain lines where I'm like, there's no, there's no room for segregation, racism, you know, shit like that. Like, I don't have any tolerance for that. But there's other things where I'm like, no, it's fine. If you think that way, like, I'm not gonna, if you're religious or not, if you believe in this kind of God or this kind of, I don't care. Like, that's, there's certain things I'm like, that people care too much about that. I'm like, no, I absolutely don't care as long as it, whatever, whatever it takes for you to be a good person, <clears throat> believe whatever you want. But um, yeah, I like how I am with my band. I try to stick to the real punk roots, which is like, if everyone else is doing it, maybe you should not do it. <laughs> like, look at why, look at why, why is everyone else doing it? 
I don't know. That's always been like my mentality. It's always like, no, I'm not going to just, I'm not going to do it just because you're doing it. It's, it goes back to the old adage of like, if everyone else is jumping off a bridge, you're going to jump off a bridge. Like it's basically like that. And that's what people are doing nowadays. They're literally, well, not jumping off the bridge, but using your analogy, that's literally what they're doing. Like they've yeah. listened to influencers. They're going to go buy the same products that like, I don't understand. I don't understand society anymore. Yeah, no, exactly. Especially with TikTok and all, like, you know, a lot of social media, it's a lot of just, um yeah it's a lot of just i mean that's the thing that's the thing though is like with social media we are promoting or not we i mean i say we i say we because i don't like to really put myself separate from the rest of humans but um but they as in the social media companies are they make it so if you want your posts or your content to be boosted you have to do the trends mm -hmm. you follow trends in order to be seen like you are you are now getting um, rewarded for following trends. And it's like, dude, when social media started, it was like you were rewarded if you were original and different and you were doing something outlandish or you're doing something that just was so different. And, everyone, and that's how you would get seen. It's like, whoa, check this out. No one's done this before. And it was all about that. Now it's just like you have to use the trending songs. You have to do the trending things. You have to make it look this way you have to make it look that way and then you'll get seen and it's just like for me i'm like this is so fucking gross <laughs> like, this is so toxic see with me i don't do any of that i i just throw my stuff on instagram tiktok whatever social media platform i'm on i let it grow organically people don't see it i personally don't care someone will that's my thought process yeah. you'll reach the people that it's meant to reach and um, yeah, that's kind of for me, I, I kind of like I'll pay for some ads to kind of get my stuff seen. But I, I do my own thing. I do my own my own style of videos. I do my own just content. And like, I know I could do more and I want to. I'm actually getting to a point I've been kind of just reevaluating what I can do to grow because I really do want to grow. I just was being such a like, nah, fuck the system. Like, I don't want to do it that way. Um, but I'm, I'm kind of the same way. I'm literally the same way. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, but now I'm kind of getting to a point. I'm like, okay, how can I, how can I kind of adopt these things that kind of earn success or whatever? But I can do it in my own way because that's what I would rather do. Um, because at the end of the day, I know that there's people like you, people like me that are, you know, they're yearning for individuality. They're yearning for people who, uh think critically and want to be in that community, want to be around people that they know they'll be free from judgment. Cause I feel like there's just much judgment from certain communities that I don't even want to like be in, like even in the, in like the emo and punk community, like so there's a lot of judgment. The same Some... thing in the podcasting community. I used yeah. to, well, I wasn't really in the podcast community, but I would listen to stories like, yeah, I'm not, it's not for me. I'm going to be independent and do my own thing. I can't deal with people like who are like backstabbing and all that stuff. Even if they're with the same group of people that are doing the same things, like I'm good. You guys could do that. I'm going to walk away from that. Yeah, exactly. I don't like, I don't like any of that toxic shit, but yeah, I don't like the judgment. I don't like the whole, like, yeah, no, I don't, I don't think that. And they're like, Oh, you don't think that? Oh, well then you're obviously a piece of shit. <laughs> it's like, what? No, I'm not. I swear to God, I'm a good person. So I just, uh yeah i i i want to create a community where it's like nah you can you can absolutely you don't have to think like everyone else you don't have to do everyone else oh you didn't get that covid vaccine you're safe here it's fine i don't care you don't care if you got it care if you don't get it like i just hate the whole like this or that i can't stand i can't stand segregation in any form and the fact that i that we experienced like that form of segregation during the whole covid thing about the whole vaxxed or not vaxxed mm -hmm. i'm like yo, this is 21st century segregation. This is fucking wild. Yeah, nobody was thinking about that. I've been down that rabbit hole. I was a conspiracy theorist. I'm not going to lie. I did all the research on 9-11, all that conspiracy stuff. And there's one thing you just brought up that no one was really thinking about. You're separating two different people, groups. People who are not got a shot and people who did. And yeah. no, it was just going through over people's head. <clears throat> totally. And I like I would tell people that I'm like, dude, you're just you're you're promoting segregation. And they're like, what? No, we're not. It's a choice. And I was like, well, no, not for everyone. Not there's people who are told like, no, you shouldn't get this shot yet because of their health, and you're grouping them in that box too. Like, <laughs> there's all kinds of reasons. That's why not everything's black and white. That's why I don't don't do 
don't don't segregate in general just don't do it <laughs> it's not good <laughs> so it was a wild time and but i feel like some of that some of that thought has dissipated thankfully but some of it still exists and i'm I, like at the end of the day i've stuck i've stuck with my roots i haven't changed i i have some you know i know some people that they definitely totally did. They went in a direction that I'm like, yo, what? I never would have thought that you would lean into that. That's wild. Like, but fear does that. Fear kind of will bring out something in you that you'll make you out act outside your character. And I feel like that kind of happened for a lot of people. Um, in which, you know, I can't fault them because fear is a very strong tool and it's why politicians and media uses it. <laughs> um so. Anyways, I forgot where exactly where I was going with that thought, but I've, uh, yeah, I've just, I've always just tried to stay true to my roots. And when I find myself not changing while the world's like kind of going through change or people are changing in ways that I'm like, what? Um, it just kind of further solidifies. I'm like, nope, I got to stand exactly where I am. This is where I, I can trust this ground. <laughs> I'm gonna, this is where I'm going to stick. And I made it through it. I'm like, yeah, cool. I, that none of that changed like my character in which I'm I can say that proudly um but I just kind of what I do now is just take that into my music and my stories and they kind of just kind of translate that experience and put it out like that and then other people can gravitate towards it or you know relate to it and stuff like that so now lastly where can people find you online and your band uh, yeah, so I, I try to make my stuff easy to find. Uh, my name, at Kyle underscore Rutchland, R-U-T-C-H-L-A-N-D. Um, that's my personal Instagram. I'm very active on it. That's really the only one I use. I don't use any other social media because I just, I don't want to. <laughs> There's just too much. It's too much. And then uh, the band is at Havoc, H-A-V-O-C underscore Faction, F-A-C-T-I-O-N. Um, and then our music's all over Spotify, Apple Music, YouTube, everywhere. Um, but I run both accounts, very active on there. So if anyone ever wants to talk, converse, anything like that. And you guys can follow me on my YouTube channel, which is at uh, Hawkett Media. That's where you'll find my interviews, my game streams, and uh, soon to be my photography related content, which is to be determined. That's it for me. Thank you so much, Kyle, for coming on the show today. Yeah, thank you so much for having me, man. I'm excited. I'm actually going to go check out your game streams, too, on your YouTube channel for sure.